Yeah. So, oh, yeah. I'm ready. Born ready. Hey, and welcome to the wrap up. If you haven't been here before, this is the Raptors Republic live post game show where we recap, dissect, and have some fun talking about the game tonight. We hope to have each and every one of you guys here after every Raptors game this season. I am your co host, Sahal Abdi. And tonight, as always, I have my great co host here with me, Oren Weisfeld. Oren, uh, tonight, the Raptors came up victorious versus the Memphis Grizzlies, 128 to 113. Pretty good game. Another high scoring one. I feel like it's going to be high scoring all year for Toronto as long as they play defense like this. I mean, it did get better at the end. Um, Memphis did come into this game, you know, riding a three game losing streak. Now that's four. But they had a bunch of injuries across the board. So when I was coming into this game, I was kind of looking at it like a must win. Um, did you enjoy that game? Did you enjoy the end of it, Orton? Yeah, man. I had a fun time. Um, I thought when Lowry went down and and the Grizzlies went on a run in the second quarter, I thought, "Uh oh, SpaghettiO!" But then, yeah. <laughs> then the Raptors they closed the the second half overall. Uh, they played really well. They really in did some great in game adjustments, which I'm sure we'll get into some of them. They mm-hmm. figured a lot out, even without Nurse on the sideline, and they adjusted well and kind of also got you know a little, a little bit lucky with the three-point ball just going in all game whereas the Grizzlies just started seeing a lot of in and outs yeah no for sure um like I said the Memphis Grizzlies were running into this game with a lot of injuries um Jaron Jackson was out Justice Winslow Brandon Clark DeAnthony Melton all out for the Raptors it was just really OG and Anobi um as per the usual of the last couple of weeks and then Patrick McCaw who's still not back from that knee injury um I think Memphis, you know, considering everything that went down tonight, their injuries, um, how they started the game. I mean, Raptors took a quick and easy 7-0 start to begin that game. Um, I mean, it's a loss for Memphis. I'm looking at it from their side. And, yeah, you don't like to see a crumble, uh, a team crumble that late. Um, did you like how Memphis played considering all their circumstances? Because we got to remember they're missing a lot of their key guys out here. Hmm. Overall, um, yeah, they're they're really young, especially with Bain and Tillman getting such big minutes in the rotation. So I think overall, pretty good game. But at the same time, like they started really well, but at the same time, they did kind of get, I would say, out coached in a way uh, as they went down the stretch. They they had great offense at the beginning of the game, and it was kind of just a shootout going both ways. Both teams couldn't defend each other. And then the Raptors locked down their defense and that was the yeah. difference. And really like JV who was doing a lot of damage in the post stopped doing that damage. And John ja Morant, um, who I want to talk about, he was killing the Raptors for three quarters of the game. I think he sat, you know, most of the third and then I expected him to come in the fourth and keep doing what he was doing, which was, you know, such a quick twitch athlete with such a great cool. burst get to the paint every time and then make the right read. Um, but he he really got contained. And I think Bembry was a really big part of that. The Raptors went to Bembry on him in the fourth instead of Fred. And Bembry contained his dribble really well. And when, you know, they they obviously like still went to picks and used ja that way um, with like a JV pick. But the Raptors just figured it out and... Uh, I think we'll talk about what exactly they did um, in some of these plays. But overall, I thought the Grizzlies just they had no real backup options to what they wanted to run when when the Raptors started stopping them. No, for sure. And I feel like for Memphis, they did play, like you said, it was really just a three quarter game for them. The fourth quarter, they kind of just blew it. Um, But you mentioned Jonas Valanciunas. This is a guy that, you know, win a win or loss he might have been like the player of the game. That guy was – he looked like – I said it – I tweeted it during the game. He looked like 2001 Shaquille O'Neal. He had six points and six rebounds in the first seven minutes of the game. Six points, six rebounds. I can't even do that on, on NBA 2K21. Oren, I can't even – so I don't know how – he did. He had four free throws attempted as well. He made all of those in the first seven minutes. He just absolutely destroyed Aaron Baines. And this brings me back to the same old question I've been asking over and over and over again with Aaron Baines. Um Oren, is it is it time again, like for for Aaron Baines to get benched? Like, what what do you do with Aaron Baines at this point? Because there's been a worrying trend with with Toronto that they've struggled 
with these seven footers, um, guys like Clint Capella, guys like Miles Turner. These are all guys who have had fantastic games against Toronto. I mean, Clint Capella, 21 points, 18 rebounds when they played him. Nikola Vucevic had 36 and 32 in two games, which is an 18 and 16 average. Hassan Whiteside had 16 and 9 in 19 minutes. Brooke Lopez, 20 and 7. Miles Turner, 46 and 13. He had 22 free throws attempted in two games. I mean, this isn't all Aaron Baines' fault, but there's a worrying trend for Toronto where they just can't guard the big man. Um, is this something that you see Toronto kind of definitely addressing at the trade deadline, or do they just let this ride? Yeah, I think they got to address it at some point. Um, like you said, whether it's trying to bench him, I don't think they currently have the roster to bench him, but they could definitely try and start when OG's healthy, Norm, start small, and then go to Boucher at the backup five. They were playing a lot more Stanley Johnson at the backup, yeah. nominal backup five, which they went away from. Um, but at the same time, like Stanley Johnson's not going to stop Jonas Valanciunas, no. you know? But with that being said, here's like the difference that you get with a guy like Stanley Johnson is that Jonas is still going to demand double teams. And, you know, the Raptors did that and, and got killed a little bit, but it worked at some times. But the difference with like a more nimble center in there is that in those pick and rolls where Baines was just getting torn to shreds because, you know, they can't switch it. And so it basically becomes a two on one. Um, and Baines has to kind of try to corral the shooter or the ball handler who's jaw while also watching the lob threat. He is completely lost and he's slow and he's not that smart and really it looks ugly. So at least if you have a guy like, you know, Johnson in there for, for pick and roll defense, that's a lot more promising for sure. So I think, yeah, it's an option at this point. I think they're losing Baines's minutes so badly that in the last couple of games, at least, which we've talked about that it's worth warrant. It, it warrants a try. It warrants trying something else for sure. Um, but they also have an open roster spot. And I think that's another option trying to like get a, a D league guy or yeah. like a veteran center and sign them because right now we have an open roster spot and it makes a lot more sense. At least, like, especially if there's an injury at the, at the five spot, then it would become like absolutely a requirement to, to sign someone because the depth is so weak. Yeah, the depth, the depth there just the depth really isn't there. It's non-existent. I mean, I talked about six re six points and six rebounds in the first seven minutes. Jonas finished with twenty seven points and twenty rebounds. He had eighteen and fourteen in the first half. So I mean, again, this was more of a three quarter game for Jonas more than anything. I mean, he was really on pace, obviously. For I mean, if you take his his halftime statistics, he was on pace for thirty six and twenty eight. Obviously, no no center is going to finish with that, right? It's obviously hard to follow that pace. But this is a large issue for Toronto. Even Chris Boucher was struggling down low. Um, and it's constantly become, I think, for, for at least from a fan's perspective, to just watch this and, and kind of be confused as to why Toronto has no um, kind of solution for all of this. Uh, let's get into Kyle Lowry. He didn't play much in this game. He did get injured. He left in the first quarter and was ruled out for the rest of the game with back spasms. Or I'm going to ask you a simple question. Do you think... In a game like this, you know, they did, the Toronto Raptors did obviously come out with a win, but do you think in a game like this, um, they would have needed kind of Lowry to kind of shore things up um, in that third quarter where they struggled so much? Well, we saw weird lineups. Um, Strange. The Powell, the Powell <laughs> led lineup before we yeah. knew Lowry was out. They actually kind of held their weight um, a little bit, but yeah, like, I mean, clearly they didn't need it. And that's kind of thing, something we've seen. Um, you know, the Raptors, I was reading a piece about how they have, I forget who wrote it, how they have like, they're like 13-0 and 0 in the last 13 games that Lowry didn't play for whatever reason. And it does seem like guys like Siakam and Fred Van Vliet, they play a little harder and, you know, they have a little yeah. more pop in their step. And that's what we saw tonight. Like the reason really when it comes down to it that the Raptors won, their role players did not give them a ton offensively, but Powell, Siakam, and Fred all had about 30 points each. So that's 90 points right there. And, yeah. and you know, no one else really has to give you that much when those guys are so efficient too and, um, and playing so well. So like 
Lowry, we talked about this. He's absolutely the culture setter. Um, the team revolves around his leadership, but they can withstand his absences because it's such a, you know, it's just like the culture goes beyond his play. It's such a well-run organization that they know what their plan is coming into games and they're not going to stay, go away from that plan because yeah. a Lowry has to go sit. No, for sure. And I think this was a very strange game for Toronto in the sense that um, Norm, Van Fleet, Siakam, you could probably say they got 90 to 95% of their offense from those three guys. 32 from Siakam. He shot really well, 11 for 18. Fred Van Fleet also shot well. He was 8 for 14 from the field. He had 32 points. Both guys were a plus. Norman Powell was also a plus. He had 29 points, 10 for 17 shooting. And then obviously the rest of the Raptors didn't really shoot as well. Chris Boucher had a solid game, 12 points, 10 rebounds. Like we said earlier, Aaron Baines didn't really play much. He only had 19 minutes compared to Chris Boucher's 29. The Raptors shot really, really well from, from three-point range. Norm, six for nine. Fred, four for seven. Siakam, five for eight. Uh, Finally, he did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I was going to say, do you think this is, a, this is a trend that Toronto can kind of ride? Or do you think... Um, this was kind of an anomaly considering that 90% of their offense came from those three guys. Mm. Um, I mean, Lowry complicates the situation in a good way because he's such an efficient yeah. offensive player and such a good playmaker that he takes a little, a few shots away from those guys for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, your best players being that efficient just simplifies things for everything else because a guy like Bembry, Boucher, Stanley, Utah, they know that they don't they they don't have to score really at the end of the day when when your stars are playing that well all you have to do is focus on the defense and focus on like the little things offensively moving the ball that kind of stuff. So that's nice to see. In terms of Siakam though, I think I think it like I don't think it's sustainable that the Raptors will shoot whatever they shot today. Um, because they just shot the ball incredibly well from yeah. three. But I think Siakam, and I said this last week, that I would like him to continue shooting threes, um, even though they weren't going in for the majority of the season, because we he has a good enough track record that he is a good above-the-break three-point shooter. Um, it just h- hadn't been really going down for him. And finally, like this has to feel, you could tell, he was happy. You could tell it felt really good for him to just finally see those shots go down. And once they did start going down, Memphis had no answers for him. I mean, it helped that he wasn't the only threat. Like uh, Norm and, and Fred were also threats. So that helps, of course. But once Siakam started hitting the threes, it just becomes so, so hard to contain him. And that's why you saw right after a three in the in the third or fourth quarter, he hit a three. And then the next play, he just had a blow by to straight line drive to the rim because you have to defend him out there at the three-point line. Yet he's such a quick first step that he can get to the rim super quickly. Like with a, when, when guys have to run him off the three-point line. Defensively, I saw a couple of people make this point on Twitter, and I think it's a really good point. Um, the Raptors scheme where they contest three point shots by running out and jumping um, people off the line yeah. has really been figured out by the league. And I think it's because the Boston series where Boston really figured it out, you know, they had the time to look at the film and say, this is what Toronto is doing. If we just pump fake it, wait for them to run by us or jump by us, then we're going to have like either an open three or, you know, find a cutter or whatever. And now it seems like the whole league has really figured that out and maybe it's something that the Raptors need to adjust a little bit on because it's putting them, it seems like they're sometimes being a little bit over aggressive. Yeah, for sure. And that over aggressiveness has kind of hurt them on the perimeter, especially this year. You saw even Memphis in this game. And it feels like, again, another trend we've been talking about is obviously the Raptors defending the three because they've done it so well the last two years. And then this year has kind of been the opposite where they're allowing a lot more open threes and they're kind of deciding when and when not to kind of, you know, for their defensive rotations to be crisp or not. Um, I didn't like, personally, um, Nick Nurse getting ejected in this game because I do feel like sometimes our coach is a little – little, gets a little heated on the, on, on, the, on the sidelines a little bit. Kind of 
I mean, it goes well with our with our team. I mean, Kyle Lowry does the same. We have a lot of passionate guys on this team, including Nick Nurse. So that takes me to the wrap up turning point of the game, which was Nick Nurse being ejected, and that's that's weird because normally I'm, I'm, I'm there's a highlight or something to play here, but after Nick Nurse was ejected, the Toronto Raptors went on a 28 to six run, and they held that lead for the rest of the game. Oren, was this just by mistake? Was it people looking at Adrian Griffin and saying, "Hey, this guy's are no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that to Nick Nurse." W- what happened there? I don't know, man. I mean, the maybe it's just a case of the Raptors coming together against yeah. against the powers that be that want to keep them down, you know, because <laughs> the refereeing has been a problem all season. I saw Blake yeah. Murphy tweet that the Raptors are up to 28. And now I think after the Nick Nurse ejections, technical fouls on the season. And did you see this tweet? I did not see this tweet. Okay, I, guess I, I, how I was many, wondering guess how many the, they the, were relative to everyone else. Yeah, guess how many the second the team with the second most has. Uh, so the Raptors are at 28. I'm going to say the, the team with the second most has 25. Less than 20. I don't know the number, but he no said less than 20. No way. Yeah. yeah, and it's hurt oh them in close games goodness. too. It's, it's not just something that we can like sit here and complain about because it's slightly annoying to watch. It's also legitimately hurt them where they, they've lost a lot of games by one or two or three points, and those technical fouls are free points pretty much. Um, and this has always been a thing, watching the Raptors is like the refereeing hurts us and then the team complains. But this season, it seems egregious uh, at some points. And and the refereeing also seems egregious, but it always has. So I don't know what exactly is different in terms of like, maybe they thought that once they would win a championship, they would get the respect that they deserved. Um, it hasn't happened, I don't think. And they just need to, they need to stop getting so emotional about that stuff. And I agree with you. Nick needs to stop. He's been getting a lot of those teas. He's losing hair, or and the guy's losing hair. Yeah. Yeah. It's a stressful job. He's going to be like Barack after eight years in the office. <laughs> just look like he's, he's just getting years of his life age, shaved off. Age 30 years and like eight, eight years. No, but Nick Nurse, I mean, if anything, I want a passion out of a coach. That's a quality that a coach I think should always have. Um, Nick Nurse cares obviously about this team a lot. Um, but it does feel like Toronto has gotten, you know, the the kind of the, I don't know if I could say this, the shitty part of the stick from the referees in the last few games. But again, a team like Memphis, they shouldn't have to rely on the whistle. I mentioned it earlier, you know, in our in, in our live show that, you know, Memphis is missing a lot of guys. There shouldn't have this shouldn't have been a game where Toronto won it at the end. This should have been a game where Toronto comfortably led. I know again they're losing, they lost, sorry, I should say, one of their best players in Kyle Lowry to start the game. But again, you have more than enough kind of firepower to go against a team like Memphis was very little depth. I mean, there, I was looking, I was looking at this stat. They had, I think at the end, in the middle of the fourth quarter, 63 out of 75 of their shots were shot by their starters. So like, they're not even really relying on their bench in that game. It was really just a starters game for Memphis other than Grayson Allen, who came off the bench, who played a little bit there. Um, I wanted to talk about Grayson Allen really quickly. Let's just, uh, you know, this is this is this is really weird because I don't like talking about bench players on other teams, and I want to get through dirty, it quickly. Dirty but boy. yeah, I was gonna say Grayson boy. Allen. He's a that he guy. Looks, he looks like me though, so I can't even. He does kind of look like you. Okay, let's change, <laughs> let's change the topic then. No, um, okay. let's get into let's get <laughs> let's get into some NBA topics around the league. Um, I feel like this game. Uh, We've talked about it enough, but we will get back to it in a second. But let's talk about some topics across the league. Um, Cool. I don't want to even say cool. I think for me, you know, one of the rumors that came up that I enjoy and still enjoy to see um, was was Andre Drummond. Um, Did you think, you know, did you like the Andre Drummond rumors, the trade rumors that were coming out? I don't know. I'm just so tired of, of Baines at this point that any center looks desirable to me. Did you like the Drummond rumors? Um, so I, th- I think I said before that he doesn't really make that much sense to me, but it depends what the price tag is. Like, yeah, if the price tag is less than a first round pick, if it's like a second and like a couple expirings, um, then yeah, that makes sense to me just as like an upgrade this season. But 
like I said, I don't see the point in leveraging the Raptors' future unless you are getting someone who fits the timeline. A would be option number one. So a younger player, maybe a restricted free agent who you could pay this summer, no matter what the money is, just match whatever is offered to him. Or B, someone who really takes you to the next level of, you know, being elite like a Bradley Beal. Um, But unless it's for that type of player, um, I don't really see the point of like trading away a first round pick in a really stacked draft to get Drummond who might help you, you know, be the fifth seed instead of the sixth seed or whatever, but not necessarily be that like great. I guess yeah. when it when it comes to really matching up against the East best teams. No, for think? sure. I, I know Oren that you know you like doing this every single time we go live is that you like getting to a certain play, diagnosing it during the game. I think you had a couple plays that you wanted to get to, maybe one, maybe two, two if they're lucky, the live viewers. Um, did you want to quickly talk about that play? Okay, sure. So we'll go back to the game and then we'll 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 zoom back out to do some uh NBA stuff. So why don't we yeah. do why don't we do the transition first? So we'll talk about the Raptors transition offense. So a shameless plug here. I wrote about Toronto's struggles in transition for Sportsnet. If you want to read that, go over there or you can go to my Twitter and see it. Um, but one of the things I wrote about specifically, because the Raptors have been pretty inefficient in transition this year, even though they're still running like the second most in the league. And it is their identity to an extent because, you know, they're a team that, has a turnover rate that's number one in the league. They turn opponents over the most and they run off steals. And we saw that a lot this game. We, they turned Memphis over quite a bit. They ran quite a bit. Yeah. But especially when their bench was in the game, the Raptors really struggled um, to create good um, offense off transition. So the play we're about to see is Terrence Davis. I mean, people probably remember this because it was pretty ugly. It's a Terrence Davis. Uh, two on one with uh, who's running with Boucher. Yeah, was, I, think, I believe it was Boucher. I think. Yeah, it was Boucher. It was Boucher. So he tried to throw Boucher the lob. Um, he takes a charge on John Morant, and so it's an offensive foul, and it goes the other way. Um, and even Jack was talking about it during the broadcast. And I was saying as soon as he had the ball, just like, please, just like chill. You have a three on one if you wait for the trailer, you know, just chill. Actually, a four. Yeah, three on one. And if you look at Norm, um, but he, he he's really aggressive. And like, that's really Davis's problem when you look at both sides of the floor is that he's ultra aggressive. He's not a cerebral player. He's not reading the floor. The game moves a little bit too quickly for him, in my opinion. So that's why you see so many defensive mistakes and so many offensive, you know, things like that, whether it's turnovers or charges. It's just because the game's moving a little bit too quickly for him. And so making him make decisions is never a good idea. He's more of a finisher player. But when you're in transition, you don't get to choose who's the finisher and who's the playmaker. And so that's one of the reasons the Raptors have been so you know not not up to their standards in transition is just because some of the younger players still have a lot of work to do in terms of reading the floor no 100 um, and, and when i was when i was going through that you know i had to rewind first of all when i saw that because that was probably the most frustrating moment of the game i mean there was points in the game where i was just frustrated for 10 20 minutes just watching Jonas valanchunas absolutely destroy us in the paint but that play specifically I'm happy you mentioned that you highlighted that because like you said, the game moves just a little too fast for Terrence Davis. I feel like he, his, 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 his ability to mentally process is a bit slow. Um, are there any clips or that you wanted to get to other than that? Yeah. So let's go to another one. Um, this is um, more on the Raptors defense here. And yeah. so this was, this was just an example to highlight like the, you know, me and Zarar talked about this earlier in the season, how the Raptors, their roster is so shaky and faulty that it's kind of like whack-a-mole that when you fix one problem, another problem pop- pops up. And so this is an example of that where Baines could really actually handle JV in the post without 
you know, doubles coming, even though the rebounding is a whole nother problem. He could not handle him there. But in the post, he was doing fine on JV. But then when you put Boucher in the game, it's a whole nother story. And and this is just an example of Boucher getting posted up, Fred running over um, to double him, which is what they have to do. And that's the problem with Boucher at center. You know, as good as he is, he can't be relied on to actually defend big centers. And then Norm just really slow on the rotation to take to cut off the 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 cutter who is Tillman I think oh Xavier Tillman we can talk about him, uh, him and Bain. we missed it really hurts with Malachi Bain. in the G League too just seeing yeah. Tillman play as yeah. NBA players it hurts it hurts but yeah this is just you know the rap this is just to highlight the Raptors roster being somewhat shaky where if you had that real starting center you could match his minutes with a JV and then play Boucher at the four more or and then have Boucher matchup against backup fives, which he can do fine with. But since we don't have that roster construction, you know, they were forced to close with Boucher. And I actually thought he did really well overall, but you're still going to have to double a guy like JV in the post. And, and unless the rotations are super crisp, like, like Norm getting there, then you're in trouble. No, for sure. And I think even when JV was, was with Toronto for so long, I think one of his biggest weaknesses was actually passing out of those double teams. And now you've seen it. Like he's been in the, he's been in the league since what, 2011, Warren? Came in the league yeah. 2011, I believe. Yeah, 2011. Um, he's kind of worked on that quality where, you know, he was getting double team, like you said, when Chris Boucher was in the game a lot. Because, I mean, you look at just the size difference, just in terms of width. I mean, JV's a massive guy compared to Chris Boucher. And Fred. DeAndre Bembry, these guys were all double teaming and the Raptors were just relying on their rotations being crisp enough to get to that last guy and being able to contest that last open shot. And a lot of times when it ended up in a guy like Dylan Brooks' hands, it wasn't good for Toronto because he shot really, really well today. I believe he had 24 points, if I'm not mistaken. He might have scored a little at the end. 22 points, five rebounds and a couple of assists. He did miss his last couple threes. He was four for eight from three, ended four for ten. But Dylan Brooks shot well. Four for ten, still not bad, 40%. Oren, I want to get to one of my favorite segments. Yeah, Brooks is so you know good. What it is. Real quick. Bro, Brooks yeah, yeah, you want to get into Brooks. Go ahead. Just real quick. He's so good at attacking those closeouts because he has yeah. that mid-range jumper that it's just like, it's pretty automatic. You run him off the three-point line, he steps into the the mid-range, and, and he's a really nice player. And his defense on Fred Van Vliet, especially the first three quarters, really good was good. And he had that last fourth quarter. I think it was the fourth quarter where he forced the eight second violation on Fred. Fred just couldn't do anything. Yeah. In the backcourt. Um, Dylan Brooks is a really good on ball defender. He's a, he's a guy that's your, your classic prototypical three and D guy for Memphis, a guy who can score a bit, a guy who I think probably needs to work on his playmaking a little more, seems to be a little bit of a ball hog at times, but again, a very good, I think fifth or fourth option on a, on a very good team. Um, if he, if he manages to be on your bench, then he's probably going to be one of your best bench players. But again, Oren, I want to do this. This is, I honestly, I, I'm only on this live show for this reason at this point, Oren, um, the, the opposing GM segment. So you're, you're the Memphis Grizzlies GM. Okay. Now Memphis, let, let's just, let's just lay some facts down. They have a very balanced roster, right? Especially when healthy, they have, they're very scrappy. Like we saw today, they got tons of energy, extremely young team compared to the rest of the league. Um, now I'm going to pose this question to you, right? You're the, you're the Memphis Grizzlies general manager. So Memphis needs John Morant to reach obviously star level, right? If they want to accomplish all their team goals, I think that's, that's a given. So from what you saw tonight, and, and I want to say generally over the last year from John Morant, what does John need to kind of reach that, that next level, that all-star level? Cause I don't think he's there yet. I think he's very close. What does he need to kind of reach that level and reach that that level of consistency that we saw from a younger John Wall? Guys who have blossomed in the league, the Russell Westbrooks of the league, who are now squarely in their prime or even leaving their prime. What does John need to get to that next level? Yeah, so like those guys are good comparisons, but at the same time, like I think De'Aaron Fox is a really good comparison because yeah. De'Aaron's taken that leap this year that you're kind of asking about, I think, to, to be in the next tier of, of point guards. Um, even though I don't think he's that much higher than Ja, like Ja in the play in game last season proved a lot to me. Like, I think he is really close. He's approaching star level, just 
because he has the ability to really control a game. Like he's a, he's a pure point guard, but he's also like what six seven, you know. So he's he's a special player, really incredibly athletic. I love 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 watching Ja. Um, but it, if you're asking me, yeah, the reason I said he's not that those guys aren't the perfect comparisons is just because the NBA has changed. So that's why I would say if you look at um, De'Aaron Fox, what he's added to his game this year, and even especially in the past month, is a pull-up three. And yes. I think I think that's something Jock could add to his game, the pull-up three and just the more consistent pick-and-roll, punish, um, drop defenses in the pick-and-roll, because when, when people go under, he doesn't often shoot it. He's not that confident in his three ball, even though he shot it really well today, I think. Um, <laughs> that's, I think the next skill for him because we talked about the exact same thing with Siakam. Once you have that three as a threat, the defense has to guard you out there and Jaws even quicker and more athletic than Siakam. He can get to the basket so easily if guys have to guard him off out there. So that's the thing, because to me, I think he already has that playmaking, like getting his teammates involved, running, like controlling the pace of a game. He already has that at such a young age, I think. So, like, if you're the Grizzlies, if we're, we're being, like, GM mode, I think you need to be aggressive and just, like, obviously, like, yeah, the timeline is, like, a few years in the future, but Ja, yeah. I think Ja will be in that upper echelon sooner than later. So, I think you need to be aggressive in free agency and, like, even though it's Memphis, I don't know if you're getting free agents. You just, in trade talks, you know, you have to be aggressive. Yeah, for sure. Memphis is always one of those teams that I personally have always – enjoyed watching even from back in the day when they had Conley, you know, Zebo, that really gritty team that was basically comprised of a bunch of older guys. And now it's kind of flipped where they're comprised of a lot of younger guys, a lot of guys in their early twenties. Um, I mean, when, when you look at that team and you look at Grayson Allen, who's supposed to be like one of the, the, the vets on that team, he's been there. I think he's been in the league for three, four or five years now. Um, that's a young, a super, super young team. Uh, Oren, I wanted to quickly zoom back out. So we zo- we zoomed out for a second. We talked about Andre Drummond. I want yeah, to zoom probably out enough about the game, right? Yeah, I feel like we can zoom out one more time. We can talk about Kyle Lowry, but not necessarily him leaving the game today. Um, I wanted to talk about a trade rumor that kind of surfaced earlier today. Um, it surfaced on Bleacher Report, um, where um, essentially Bleacher Report was was kind of, I guess you could say, inching towards. Um, Kyle Lowry trade scenarios and just the whole like things that we've been hearing about Kyle Lowry the last couple of years. Kyle Lowry's in his last couple of prime years. I mean, people have been saying since it feels like 2016 that Kyle Lowry's in his last prime year. Um, but Kyle specifically, I mean, the trade rumors are there. A lot of teams could use Kyle Lowry, a lot of teams. Um, if we're talking the upper, upper echelon of teams, we're talking – Boston can use a guy like Kyle Lowry, even though Kemba's there. Clippers have been a team that's been long rumored um, to go there. Of course, a team like the Lakers. Really, you look at any team, Denver could use a Kyle Lowry. Is it in the Raptors' best interest to trade a guy like Kyle Lowry, considering the fact that he's an expiring contract? Um, Of course, sentimentally, no Raptors fan wants to get rid of Kyle Lowry, and that's understandable. But is it worth it? Let's say if you can, you know, snag a first round pick, snag a couple good depth players, because Kyle might just leave anyways. Yeah, I think um I saw the I saw the rumor. I didn't actually read the piece. First of all, um it is worth saying that anytime yeah. <laughs> uh, anytime someone says that the Raptors, you know, front office, people in the front office are leaking information like that about they said a segment of, of the Raptors front office, um, you know, is thinking about moving on from Lowry. I don't believe that because the Raptors don't leak anything. And if they did, it was probably, it would probably be to people that actually covered the team on a day-to-day basis yeah. or like a Woj, you know, a national person like that, not this bleacher report person. So take it with a grain of salt. But at the same time, with that being said, the idea that, you know, people in the Raptors organization are, are thinking about moving Lowry. That's probably true. If you look at it on balance, like there is probably a segment of the Raptors organization that thinks that's the best idea, but that doesn't mean they're going to do it. That just means there's 
probably some people um, at the end of the day, it's Masai's decision and Kyle's decision, I think, because I don't think they would do anything without Kyle's okay. Just given what he's done for the franchise, whether or not I think they should move him, I think only for a deal that makes a lot of sense. So only for, you know, some, a deal that's going to really fundamentally improve your team in the future. Um, so you can eliminate half the teams right off the bat. The Clippers don't have anything to trade them. You know, what can they give them expirings and like a first round pick in like 2028? Like, you know, most teams don't um, really have much they can give him. Um, but if a team like Philly comes in with like a major offer, you know, with like a Ben Simmons centered offer, then yeah, I think you need to absolutely like look into that. Um, (laughs) You need to look into that for sure. Or like, uh, you know, a maxi and like two first round picks. Yeah. You consider it. But I mean, at the same time, the Raptors could be a week or two from now sitting in fifth in the East and looking at another run and saying, do we really want to be sellers right now when this guy, I think it's not a question that we can ask or answer because we don't know how Lowry feels. And I think they have a much better gauge on how he feels as in whether or not he would think about resigning and just playing out the rest of his career in Toronto after he's already won a ring. And maybe that's not the thing that is on his mind at the foremost. And he just wants to play where he's comfortable and has all these like friends and, you know, so without really knowing his int- intentions, it's hard to answer the question, I guess. Um, well, no, for sure. And I think one of the coolest things is uh, on Twitter, One of, I think one of the best things is that we follow, I can speak for you as well. We follow obviously not just Raptors writers, you know, Raptors media. We follow, you know, people from all across the NBA landscape. Um, and I f- was following, you know, a Grizzlies writer who mentioned a very cool statistic that I really just wanted to get into really quickly for the Memphis Grizzlies. And this points back to John Morant. So uh, the tweet was that the Memphis Grizzlies are the only team in the league who do not have one player who averages more than 30 minutes per game. And that's very strange. They're literally the only team in the league. You would have thought a guy like John Morant um, would be, you know, in the mid to low 30s at this point. He is only in his second year. Dylan Brooks, Kyle Anderson, Morant, Brandon Clark, they're all at 28 minutes per game. Jonas is at 27 minutes per game. You talked about what John Morant needs to kind of reach that next level to access that that star potential. Um, is is part of the reason for for John Morant um, not kind of re- reaching that? Is, is is part of it just him not playing enough? Is that what it is? Um, but it's also because he he's just coming uh, off an injury, right? That is it as well. Yeah, for sure. So that probably plays a factor, but. No, I think maybe like if if there's like a complaint, it's maybe that he's like too passive, you know, that he's like yeah. too cares too much about getting his teammates involved. And he doesn't like he's he's not one of those guys who's like a Westbrook where he's just going to like take shot after shot. And maybe that's like the next thing is just having more of like that number one option mentality but at the same time it's harder to do that at the point guard position because you are relied upon to kind of play make for your team right no for sure and now that we're reaching kind of the end stages of this post game live show i really wanted to thank one of um our supporters rf Qureshi, who supports this post game live show so rf obviously we want to not get through this whole entire post game live show without thanking you um, so thank you to Arif, another a Raptors fan who, you know, constantly supports this show. Um, obviously, his ad is, is down below. Oren, yeah, I got one question me? for you before. We yeah, yeah. Finish. I was going to ask you final thoughts. Yeah, I just want to know, what do you think about the Raptors fouling? Because, I mean, it's been a really big problem all season um, where they're just they're kind of bailing teams out by fouling them. Um and yeah. I wonder if you have any thoughts on why why that's happening compared to last year at such a high rate. I think naturally, you know, the foul rate when you, there's such a large discrepancy from from year to year, which is what we're seeing this year, a lot of it just has to do with the Raptors not being as good defensively. And what I mean by that is you look at this entire team from from the beginning until the end, you know, from the top of the rotation to the end. 
you had a guy like Marcus Gasol last year who was probably the best communicator defensively other than Kyle Lowry on the team. You had a guy like Ibaka who's well known as, you know, one of the, I want to say the best defensive big men, at least in this conference, in the Eastern Conference. Um, Ibaka, who, who, who has been, uh, sorry, Zara, what was that? Oh, okay. Um, sorry, Oren. So I wanted to just quickly get into that. Um, so Ibaka, who was, my train of thought's gone now, sorry. Ibaka, who was the, one of the best defensive fr front men in the league, um, I think naturally you, you, you foul more um, when you're just not as good defensively, when you're late to your rotations. It's kind of a bailout, like you said, right? It's not necessarily that the Raptors are just choosing to foul more. I think if, if, if you've ever played basketball, you know most of the time when your team's fouling, it's because they've been beaten, right? It's whether you're getting beaten off the dribble. Again, you're late to a defensive rotation. You're closing out very late. The Raptors are taking a lot of chances that they wouldn't have taken the last couple of years, and a lot of that is just defensive IQ. It's just the lack of defensive IQ when you're playing guys like Terrence Davis, you know, a lot more minutes. Um, other guys, who else am I thinking of? Who, who else was – Utah, Utah Watanabe, I think, has – he's been a good defender this year. But, again, like when, you, when you're losing, like I said, Marcus Gasol, who's such a good communicator – you just lose a balance. Like it feels like the foundation's gone, which is why you're seeing the foul rate increase so much more. What did you think about that? Did you did you find any 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 trends or anything you know interesting about that? I mean, I agree with you on one hand that those two guys definitely make a big difference, but also when you look at last year, Marcus All didn't play that much. Like he was injured a lot of the season. I he think was, he, yeah. He played something like thirty percent of the regular season, so. It couldn't have been all him. And and then you look at Ibaka and Boucher, and I don't actually think that Boucher is a much worse defender, if worse at all, than Ibaka. Um, so I, I definitely question. I think a huge part of it for me is the dribble penetration. Like the Raptors don't seem – they I think they did a much better job last season of just sliding their feet and staying in front of guys. And I'm not sure, I don't have an ex explanation for that. Like Terrence Davis gets blown by, Kyle Lowry's been getting blown by a lot more than he did last season. That could just be an age thing. Um, we've talked about Siakam losing his guy and, and getting blown by. Um, but it's hard to explain because I don't know exactly why they're, they're, they're they're getting blown by so much and then and then you have to bail out and i think one one part is definitely the fact that their rotations are all over the place they used to have much better chemistry yeah. because they played the same seven eight people every night and those guys knew their roles even like a terrence davis who was their eighth man he knew his role so he, he didn't have to like play out of his position at all and now every night we see a different rotation we see different guys playing often we can go 10 11 deep some night so i think part of it is just once they get their rotations ironed out, I think they'll have better chemistry with each other eventually, and then it should get better from there. Yeah, for sure. I feel like their their rotations were kind of ironclad last year. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up really quickly. We are reaching that stage of this post game live show. So obviously, I want to thank all of our live viewers for being here tonight and watching this live show, supporting this live show. Again, the Toronto Raptors came up victorious tonight versus the Memphis Grizzlies, one twenty eight to 113. Um, I was your co-host, Sahal Abdi, and this was your co-host, Oren Weisfeld. And we'll see you again, I believe, on Wednesday. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, is it tomorrow? Yeah. Even better.